Good morning, everybody, and welcome to ART 195, um, 3D Modeling for Animation for the Spring Semester 2022. Uh, this morning, uh, what I wanted to do is to complete working on um, the, the light stage and light pole is a possible um, possibility for you guys when you present your finished um, toy assignment. And in addition to that, I wanted to talk about um, uh, um, using the multiply tools. That would be the next step in the tools that we use that provide some extremely helpful um, uh, ways of adding geometry and modifying objects that we're making. So um, last Monday, um, I struggled with this. Um, hopefully all of my technical issues are behind me, at least for the moment. Um, but uh, what I did is I brought in the reboot character that we created um, into the light pole. So let me go ahead and um, show you how that looks instead of VPR. Let's look at this in wireframe. And I'm going to switch from current um, camera to um, perspective view. So you can see the overview, okay? It's nothing more than a big bowl with coved corners um, so that we can view our object from any pretty much any angle. But what they have done for us is they've provided the lights that we need to create um, a really strong lighting setup um, <clears throat> for uh, to, to mostly for product shoots. So let me switch back to VPR and you can see that in here. Now, as you recall, um, the problem I was having on Monday is that rather than seeing the smooth uh, curves in, uh, of the bowl, um, I was getting these striations in there. And um, because it's difficult to troubleshoot while I'm talk talking to all of you, um, as soon as I logged off, I was able to fix the problem pretty easily. So I'm switching back to camera view now, and I'll show you how easy it was. And it's that sort of thing that one little thing can, can trip you up that you need to struggle with to find solutions to, um, you know, when you're having problems. And where the problem could be found was in the surface editor. So if I look at the surface editor, Okay, and you can see that I have, here's the ground bowl here. I had under reflections, and I don't know why reflections was there at 10%. So if I put in 10%, and it's going to update in a minute, and you should see those striations come back. That's the only thing that um, was tripping us up. Okay. It's taking a minute to uh, refresh. Hopefully, no problems here. Crossing my fingers. Now that I have a new router, now that I had um, Spectrum come out, yesterday I had a planned power outage by um, my city. So it was one technical problem after another. Um, not to mention that um, I'm not a performer and this is difficult for me to do. So, but I'm forging ahead with all of this. Okay. So while this is refreshing, let me show you where you can get um, the light, light stage and light bowl. Yeah, notice it finally, um, is coming is uh, refreshing now and you see the striations in the back that was all due to um, um, adding reflectivity and I don't remember ever doing that so in anyway in the meantime what where you can find the the scene for this is if you go to our shared Google Drive folder um, I have a, a folder that's labeled in red called ancillary files 
if you haven't looked at it, um, except for the, the eyes that we have or Mike's eyes, it's definitely worth um, spending a day or two, or even more checking it out. There's a lot of information in here that um, LightWave used to provide as far back as, as um, version six and eight. And after that, with let, um, version nine and on and 10, they just didn't um, supply any um, extra files anymore. But if you go into this classic content and double click on that, you should see three, um, there we go. I guess it's a double folder, my mistake. Let's double click again and I'll fix that. Um, once again, I don't know what's happening here. Classic content, let's double click again. That's not right. I gotta get rid of all that other stuff. Um, that's what I wanted to see. We have applications, backup, color tables, motions, images, all sorts of things in here. What we want to look at are both images, scenes, and objects. So let's look at the scenes first. Okay. I really don't need the rest of this. I can probably get rid of it, get rid of it. But you'll notice that there are numerous file folders in here with scenes that they have already provided for us as examples to what you can do in LightWave. And this is from older versions, much, much older versions of LightWave. The folder that I want you to pay attention to is the one Blotchy. And I don't got named Blotchy, I don't know. But if you double click on that scene or that folder, the scene that you'll be looking for is the light stage. So here's the lamp set up. Here is the light stage dot LWS. That's what you want. Okay. So now if we go back um, to scenes again, and to get the light bowl, what you need is you need to go not in scenes, but we need to go back um, one more. Let's go ahead. Let's go back again. Let's go back to classic content. Come on, come on, come on. There we go. Okay. Where you need to go next is you need to go into objects. So if you want to make copies of both of these, you can do that. Download them onto your computer and then open them. But because they're done in such an earlier version of LightWave, you're going to get a, a message telling you that you need to create a new directory folder, an empty folder into which you will place these. And then when you do remember what I did um, on on Monday is that you have to play with the lighting because in the past they used um, percentages for lighting. And now they use Lux. So you're going to have to really crank up the lighting um, to get it to work properly. So again, if I go into the blotchy folder, and I look in here, here is the ground bowl right here. That's the one that it's going to be looking for. Okay. So as a subtle reminder here, um, what I was doing, let me go ahead and I can close, let's see if I can't get rid of that reflection again. Um, change that to zero and close surface editor. And then let's go back to lights again. So I'm going to view this instead. Um, I'm going to look at it in, uh, lightweight and wireframe. And let's look at it in perspective view again, so we can review all of the lights. And then we're going to move on quickly to um, uh, to multiply tools. So let's go ahead and switch to perspective view. So let's start 
from the top. If I switch from light to from objects to lights, we can select them individually and I can go here. Well, let's start with a key light. This, as you can tell from the shape of it, is an area light. And then if you select properties, it will tell us. Um, I've cranked this all the way up to 48 lux. Maybe I can get away with a little bit less because I was noticing that the hands and the feet <clears throat> um, detail seems to be kind of blown out. So maybe I need to reduce um, some of the intensity of the lights a little bit more. But that gets me started. Okay, so that's um, key light number one. Let's look at key light number two. And that's hidden right underneath key light number one, and it is a spotlight. Now, it doesn't need to be as intense. I have an intensity of 24 lux. Maybe even that can be reduced a bit. So these are the key lights that are giving us the, the basic shadows. But in addition to that, we have a fill light and a backlight. So what I'm going to do now is if I switch from key light to, um, oh, we also have a top light. My mistake. Let's go back up here. It's up very top here. And again, if we look at its properties, I only have 10 lux for that. So again, they have lots of them. Let's look at the fill light. That's this one over here. And it's that they've used a distant light for that. Why? I don't know. I would probably use a point light, but um, it's as good as any, just to fill in the, the shadows, to make sure that the shadow side of our object looks um, a little bit better than it would normally. And again, that's just 10 lux. And then we have a backlight. So what you can do with this is you can pretty much move the camera just about anywhere. Um, and you're going to get really solid lighting for your product. And this one too is a little bit, even a little bit less. It's eight lux. Okay. So I'm going to switch back from um, wireframe to VPR. And you can see what it looks like. Now you are somewhat limited to the your camera angles. If you try to look up a little bit too much, um, what's going to happen is that you're going to see the edge or the rim of the light stage. Um, and that's not what you want. You want to be looking down and in, but you can look up just a little bit. So let's go back to the camera view. Come on. And again, I'm going to be able to move the camera a little bit just to show you what I mean here. I'm going to look at it in wireframe. Just it's less taxing on the computer when you do that. And make sure that I select camera and I'm going to hit T for move. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to move this up or down, I should say. And then I'm going to hit Y to rotate it and look at it up. Let's move it down again. I don't want to be down underneath the floor, so I need to be careful about where I move my camera. But notice, let's see, yeah, notice here, let me go back to um, VPR and you can see that there is the, the, the edge of the bowl. Now, if you wanted to extend the bowl, you could do that. If you wanted a low angle kind of worm's eye view, which isn't a bad idea, and that wouldn't be hard to do. So let's go back to um, from wireframe to VPR and you can see what I'm talking about. Yeah, see the black background, not so cool. So you'd probably want to extend the light bowl and it, you know, expand it upward so we can get a better shot of, of our um, reboot character. Okay. Are there any questions so far about um, this. Now for your toy assignment, um, I encourage you to try at least one shot using the light stage with a light bowl. Um, but also if you wish to create a second rendering of it and create a composite scene and use a background image as we did with the reboot character, um, that would be 
that's fine for you to do too. But again, the emphasis should be on the toy. Um, I don't want a little bitty toy in a huge background if you do choose to do that. Notice that I've zoomed in on the reboot character and um, he is the prominent and dominant uh, part of my scene. Um, the rest is really sub, uh, subordinate to it. So that would be the, true for you guys too when you're working on that. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna close um, layout. If there are, there are no questions, then I'll go ahead and quit this. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, close. I wanna, let me go ahead and put a file. Come on, my computer's starting to slow down. That's not good. So I wanna close. I don't want to render any of this. I just want to close it. And I don't want to save it or anything. I just want to exit. So it doesn't take up any more memory for me right now. Come on. That's another thing. I don't know. I've been having issues with Adobe, um, Zoom. Zoom isn't working the way it was for the past two years. Everything is getting really sluggish. Um, and it's really annoying. And I, I mean, I don't know if I should apologize, but I know that all these technical issues are not um, your problem, but it makes it very difficult to teach this class when I'm running up against these things day to day. So let's focus on and multiply tools today. I'm going to click to the multiply tab and notice most of them right now are grayed out. So we need an object to be able to add um, geometry to. And to start with, um, we're going to start with the rounder tool. So what I need to do first, though, is I need to create some sort of object. And I'm going to start with just a simple box. And I probably should bring up my numeric requester. That's always a good idea. There we go. And I have um, the default box here. Whoops, I didn't want that. Let me undo. Come on. Select box. Let's go back to actions. Oh, come on. See, it's already, I'm already getting error messages now. Actions, I want to reset. And I want to activate. And I want to, there we go. Now let's turn off the box. There we go. Okay, so I'll leave the numeric requester up. I'm going to zoom in. I'm going to spin it around from a three quarter view. Let's go ahead and fit all. Now I can zoom out just a little bit here from my box. So a lot of things that I'm going to do today are very basic. But um, these tools really, really are extremely helpful. So here's a basic box. Now, if you recall, um, one of the things that options that we have as I'm building the box is that I can add rounded corners, but they're added to all of the corners all of the edges, all of the sides. Well, what if I only wanted to add to one side and one alone? Well, there's a way that I can do that. I can either, if I wanted it to only add rounded corners to the top, I could switch from point view or point selection to polygon selection. And with the polygon selected, I have it selected or not. There we go. Now it's selected. Now I can select under multiply. And I can select the rounder tool. Now the rounder tool is pretty cool. Um, watch what happens when I go to action and I select activate. It's going to really mess this thing up. Now, right now I've selected points. So it's only taking the corners of the, that polygon and rounding them. 
So hint, hint, um, for those of you who are interested in doing, uh, who haven't decided on your toy or are kind of behind, um, a pair of dice would be really good. And this would be a way of rounding the corners of those dice. And you can, we'll get to the Boolean functions soon. So you could apply um, and add the little dots to each of the sides. Now, if I switch to edges, this is what happens. Notice how it rounds it. Now we can change, we can go to presets or we can change the um, preset distance. Now, the number of rounding polygons is set to 21. I don't need that many. So I'm gonna select the spinner here and try to go back a little bit. So you can see that it's to be a smaller yeah, edge here. Okay. Oh, yeah, it went really, really small. So let me go back to one. Yeah, it's taken a while to catch up. So that's one foot. Let's change it to three inches. And you'll see what I mean. So there you go. But again, just the top is rounded and that's it. Now, if I only wanted one side rounded, I can do that as well. So let's go ahead and deselect. Let's turn off the rounder tool. And instead of the entire polygon, again, you can select individual points and you can use that point selection that I was talking about. Okay. Let's go back to the rounder tool. Let's deselect polygons. Come on. No, 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 no. I want to turn that off. Let's deselect. And let's undo. That's what I want. I want to deselect polygon now. And this time I'm going to select instead of points or polys, I'm going to select edges. So here's the edge and I'm just going to select one edge. Come on. There we go. So it's highlighted in green. And now what I can do is I can use the rounder tool again. Let's go ahead and activate and see where it gets us. Now that's not what I want. Oh, that's because it says um, edges. Did it go back? You know what? Um, let me turn it off. I thought I had selected the edge and I know I did. But again, this is where things kind of get slow down. So let's select the edge again, select the rounder tool. And I'm slowing down here because it should only affect that one edge and nothing else. So let's go ahead and select activate. And it's not working because something else is affecting it. And I don't know why. Um, it looks like all those edges were affected and I don't want all of those effect edges. I just wanted one edge selected. So let's go back and it, one edge is selected. Let's go ahead and turn off rounder. Again, um, I think for the remainder of this semester, hopefully um, things aren't this bad from day to day, but again, it appears that I'm having technical issues once again. So let me deselect and try one more time. And if that doesn't work, take my word for it. All you have to do is select one edge and it will round just that edge and that's it. So let's go back again, select the rounder tool. Chamfer tool, rather than rounded corners, 
creates just a, a chiseled edge. That's all the difference that that is. So there's chamfer, rounder. Let's go ahead and move on to another. So I'm going to go ahead and deselect that. I'm taking enough time on that. Okie doke. Extrude. So to use extrude, you don't work with a three-dimensional object. You work with a two-dimensional shape. So let's go to another, um, another layer here. Okay, so I'm on a new layer. And what I need to do now is I need to select, create, and I want, um, I'm gonna switch back to polygons. And I'm gonna create, um, let's just, for um, our purposes here, since my computer is working so sluggishly, um, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna select um, a disk tool. Now, normally you wouldn't have to do this because you have, um, uh, you can create from the disk a column. But if I click and I drag here and I hold down the control key, and I'm doing that from the back view. And if it's a little bit off, I don't care. I, normally I get kind of persnickety about this sort of thing and I want it to be um, perfectly round, but I'm good. I'm just gonna leave it as that. Just a flat two-dimensional disc. It can be any flat two-dimensional shape. And now what I wanna do is I wanna go to multiply and let's go to extrude, okay? And with extrude selected, now I can go ahead and I can click and I can drag on that from the top view. And notice that now it has that two dimensional shape has three dimensions. I've given it depth. Now, so from time to time, if you extrude in the wrong direction, let's do it this way and see what happens. No, it's working really well. So maybe they have updated or made some changes to it. Sometimes you will get the shape to be inside. In fact, it is, it's, there we go. Sometimes it will look inside out. Okay. So now I can turn off um, extrude. And we can zoom in on it and you can see. So I used um, the, the old, um, you know, creating an ellipse to do this, but again, it can be any shape. Okay, so that's the next one. That's um, extrude tool. Next one is very similar. It's lathe, and I'm going to undo this, and I'm going to move the ellipse over. So I'm going to hit T for move. And again, this can be any shape. And I want it to be along, you know, I won't, it doesn't have to be like this. Um, but I want to make sure that uh, my center is at zero, zero, zero. So I'll turn off move. Now I can go ahead and I can select lathe. Okay. And now what I want to do is, I, again, we have the default sides of 24. And now I can create a torus shape. So I'm going to go ahead and activate. And this is what I was talking about. Notice how it, it looks a little strange here. I'm going to go ahead and fix it. And because it, um, it lathed automatically at 360 degrees, you don't have to lathe a full 360. You can actually lathe less than that and have just a partial or you can, uh, you know, form, or you can lathe multiples to get a corkscrew shape. So we'll do that next. I'm gonna zoom out and you can see it's, it doesn't look quite right. That's because it, by lathing it in one direction, the surface normals are, were facing inward rather than out. So if I hit F for flipping normals, Notice that it, it reads correctly now. And here's my torus shape donut. Now, they already have a torus shape. You don't need 
to, to use this, but it works very well, for example, if you wanted to make a glass, um, let's say a champagne glass, if you only made part of it, you know, uh, the half of it, um, and then lathed it, you would get your, your shape, the form that you're looking for. Now, to get something like a corkscrew, I'm gonna do that next. So let's go ahead and let's undo this and undo that again. And I'm gonna shrink this down a little bit. I'm gonna go ahead and hit um, to size it. So let's go to modify. And I want to change the size of this. And I want the action to be to the center of selection. Just so you can really see the, the corkscrew effect in here. Okay, so that works. And I'll probably move it over just a little bit. That ought to do it. Okay. Turn off move. Now let's go back again to multiply. And let's go ahead and um, use lathe once again. So these are the variations of some of these tools. And instead of just 360 degrees, oh, come on. Go to activate and that goes around, but instead of 360 degrees, there is a little widget that I have that I can come back in here and change it to a lesser, or I can just use this spinner in here. So start angle is 360, end angle is, is or start angle is zero, end angle is 360. Um, I'm gonna put in a minus so that it's auto automatically flipped. So let's go ahead and put it instead of 360 degrees, I'm gonna put a minus 360 degrees and see how that flips the surface normals by spinning it the opposite way. Well, I'm gonna go ahead now and I'm gonna do it 1360 degrees. So if I put a one in front of that and hit the tab key, it just makes a whole bunch of these. And I'm gonna to have to add the number of sides because I only have 24, but watch what happens now when I change the offset of this and I move this up. Like so and let's go ahead and move in perspective view. Let's go ahead and move this down a little bit. Now to get a nice smooth corkscrew effect, Instead of 24 sides, let's go ahead and spin this up and it will get much smoother. And again, use the number of, minimum number of sides that you absolutely need. And I'm gonna wait for my computer to catch up here. I think I have way more sides than I need, but look at how smooth that is. So that's a nice corkscrew effect. And it's this effect too that you can use to create screws and all sorts of things, threads and, and, and screws. So this was just way too many. I'm just gonna say um, 50 and see what I get here. Yeah, see it needs more than 50, but maybe 150. sides to smooth the whole thing out. Yeah, that's getting close. So I didn't need over a thousand of those um, sides to make this work. So you take, um, if, again, if you wanted to make a simple cup, we can do that maybe on another day, um, or a simple glass, um, like a champagne glass, you make only half of it, and then you can lathe it. If you wanna make a corkscrew of some sort, you can, again, use the lathe tool again, and spin it, but um, more than 360 degrees. I did this um, a total of um, 1360 degrees so that I have multiple um, rotations. 
and then I set the offset to determine. Now, if I want less than that, if I want a really tight, you know, um, screw, then I just reduce the offset of that. And then when this is done, you can size it up. You can do whatever you want with it. It's pretty nice. See that? So I'm creating a really tight spring here. There we go. So we've got that. Now, let's go ahead and we've already used smooth shift before and smooth scale is very similar. But I'm gonna go back to what we have here, our cube again. There we go. Fit to um, hit A to fit to all the quadrants. And I'm going to go ahead <clears throat> and I'm going to, um, well, you know what? Let's do something a little bit different. I kind of run the risk of screwing things up when I do this. Let's go ahead and use bevel and I'll show you what happens. And then I'll use smooth shift to show you what happens. Again, it, it bears repeating because when you want to add geometry, these are the tools to use more often than not. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to create a sphere. So under the Create tab, I'm going to go ahead and select a ball. Let's go ahead and reset. And let's go ahead and activate. Oh, come on. Oh. Ball is what I want, not box. Let's go ahead and activate, reset, activate. There we go, now we have our sphere. Let's go ahead and turn this off. Fix it in space. There we go. So what if I wanted to create something like a line saucer? Okay, how would I do that? You can start with a sphere. That's not a bad way to go. And so what I can do is I can select polygons and I'm gonna select a couple of them here. I'm clicking and dragging and going in one direction. Make sure that I have a number of them. And now what I wanna do is I wanna select loop. So if I go back up under here under selection, so I wanna select all of them all the way around. So if I go under select, and I select loop, <clears throat> it didn't work. So let me deselect it. Come on. And let's just select a handful of these. From one row. And now let's go ahead and say select loop. There we go. So now they're all selected. I'm going to go ahead and hold down the shift key and click again on a couple of these. And let's go ahead and say select loop again and see if I get two rows of them instead. I'm going to say select loop. There we go. That's what I wanted. So now I want to create my flying saucer shape. Um, so I have the top of the sphere, the bottom of the sphere, and I want to stretch these guys out, but I want to add that geometry and I want it to behave uniformly as one object. So the tool that you would use for that would be smooth shift. Okay. So if I select smooth shift and I click, and now I go ahead uh, under the modify tool. Hopefully that's done. Let's go to modify now. 
and let's go ahead and select size from the center of the object and let's go ahead and stretch it out. Come on. And it all behaves as one. But I need to taper this a little bit. So let's go ahead and with all of them, you know, all of those polygons selected, I was able to add the geometry. Let's go ahead and under multiply or actually modify. Let's go ahead and select stretch. And I'm going to go ahead and from this view, I'm going to stretch it in a little bit like so. Let's go ahead. There we go. I'm getting it off a little bit. Again, my computer is lagging, so forgive me, please. There we go. So now we have our basic flying saucer shape. I'll turn off stretch. I'll deselect the polygons. And now let's go ahead and hit the tab key for organic, more organic or multi tabs. Now you have, and this could be a top, this could be a little flying saucer. Um, you know, I need to tweak the proportions, but you get the basic idea. So this would be something to do for your toy as well. Maybe you can find a little um, image of a flying saucer toy. Um, so it wouldn't take you long to build the model itself but it might take you a while to get the images that you need to project onto the object to make it look a little bit real. Um, it could be like the American flag or it could be some sort of foreign or alien flag that you've made up. Um, any kind of details that you would you know, imagine that you would see on a flying saucer. That's what I'm looking for is to, to really you know, deck out the surface and then work with lighting to turn it into something really spectacular. Okay, so that right there was under uh, multiply. That was um, smooth shift. Now, the one that I failed to talk about was bevel. Um, and that one we've used before. And rather than just, uh, I'm going to explain it to you that if you use bevel, um, well, let's undo this a couple of times. Let me redo that. Uh, oh, okay, we have that. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to stretch this out again using bevel. Select bevel. And I'm going to go ahead and click to activate it. Now I'm going to go ahead and go ahead and use stretch again. And let's stretch it out. And initially it looks the same, doesn't it? However, where we run into problems here is when I'm done, well, that's okay that it's off. I'm going to go ahead and turn off stretch. And I'm going to deselect the polygons. Come on, turn it off. Um, deselect polys. And let's just select one polygon here. Now, if I hit T for move, I move it. Notice how it behaves separately from all the rest. Had I done that before with the smooth shift, you couldn't do that. They all behave uniformly. They're all attached to one another. But when you use bevel, it changes multiple polygons uniformly, but they behave separately as individual extrusions. Okay, 
everybody see what I'm doing here? So let me go ahead and undo a couple of times. Let's turn off deselect. And let's see what the next multiply tool that we have here. So we use the smooth shift, smooth shift, um, smooth scale, and multi shift are very much, they're all variations of the same thing. So go ahead and experiment with that on your own. Um, the next one that I want to cover, since we're at the you know, 48 minute, is the thicken tool. And this can be really, really useful. Um, I've used it numerous times. Um, so I'm going to go back to our cube. Let's deselect the poly. Come on. Oh, I've got move tool selected. That's why. Okie doke. Let's go back to the cube. And I'm going to get rid of one of the sides. <clears throat> so I had with polygon selected, I'll select the front side and I'm going to go ahead and hit, um, I can hit command X to delete, or I can hit, um, um, what would be another good one? I'll just go ahead and hit command X to cut it. There we go. And again, you have inside of our box that it's not double sided. So you, when you look inside, it looks hollow or it looks invisible. But let's say I want to give that box to which I've, you know, removed one of the sides thickness to it. Well, that's what we can use here is under multiply. We can use the thicken tool. So let's come down here, thicken. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to click from the side and I'm going to pull it in a little bit. select anything here. It probably didn't select it. So let's try again. I thicken. There we go. Now it's selecting. Now if I click in here, on one of the sides and drag it in. Notice that I'm giving it thickness. Now, there are other ways that we could achieve this. I could, you know, I've created an extrude. Um, there's another way we can do this. Later on, we'll, we could use a Boolean function. This works really well for creating objects like this, like open ended boxes, but also let's say you wanted to create a helmet. And you've started with a sphere and you've cut out some polygons and now you want to give it thickness. Well, this would be the way to do it. Okay. Very, very nice tool. Okie doke. Let me um, undo that. Let's do that a couple of times. Let's bring back. Oh, come on. There we go. So I'm going to try this next one. And sometimes I just don't have a lot of success with it, but I'm going to try it anyway. I'm going to try Extender Plus. I'm willing to risk at the end of our hour here, um, giving this a whirl. So I'm going to go ahead and go to Create. I'm going to select um, box tool and I'm just going to make a flat two dimensional plane here. 
And I want to extend this and add a number of polygons. There, there, there are another, other ways of doing this, but I want to try extend a plus. Okay. So I've got it selected. Turning it off. Let's go to multiply. And I'm going to select this edge. Actually, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it as polygon here. And I'm going to select here extender plus. And I'm going to one. selecting you know what let me go ahead and try again with an edge let's select an edge and let's see if extender plus works with this so I'm going to go ahead and select extender plus and I'm going to right click and drag and it's not working No, okay, skip standard plus for right now. Um, mirror tool, we've used that before. I guess it doesn't hurt to um, repeat that. Let's go back to our box tool. Or box, I should say, not the box tool. I'm gonna go ahead and resize this. Um, and we'll do one or two more. Actually, yeah, let's go ahead and do mirror. And then um, we can go, well, yeah, we'll be running up against power here. Let me go ahead and resize this. Just resized it. Let me hit T for let's move it over. And now let's go ahead and turn off T and let's try um under multiply, let's go ahead and mirror it. So um, I can use mirror X, Y, or Z, or I can use the mirror tool itself. They're all just simply variations of one another. And if I select actions and I select reset and I activate, it by default mirrors across the X axis. Now, if I select Y or Z, you're not going to really see anything because I need to place the object differently. So if I go ahead and um, if I select Y, you'll see you really don't see anything different. It's really on top of itself. And the same would be true for Z. So let me select the X again so you can see that it's duplicated. And I'm going to go ahead and turn it off. And let's go ahead and select one of these. Let's go ahead and select the polygon tool. And I'm going to right click, select and drag around here to select all of that. And I'm going to go ahead and hit T for move. So that it is above. There we go. Above the X axis. Like so. I'm having real troubles controlling this. Um, let's turn off T for move. Let's go back to the mirror tool again. And um, let me 
deselect those polys first. Oh, I need, no, I need them selected. Never mind, because they're on the same layer as the other box. So I want to make sure that these guys are the ones that are affected. So let's go ahead and select mirror. And let's go ahead and action activate. Notice it's mirrored across the X, but if I mirror it across the Y, then it drops down below that X axis. And the same would be true for the Z. If I had it behind it, I would want it forward and you can do that. So that's the mirror tool and all the variations. Um, we're running up against the hour, so we don't have time for more. But what I do want to be able to cover, and these are important tools as well as the array, um, array tool. Um, we're going to also work on the knife tool, slice tool, connect. Um, we've already used subdivide, but we need to cover um, bandsaw pro. Um, we've used triple before, but there's a whole bunch of these under multiply <clears throat> that are really important for um, adding geometry uh, in a, a variety of ways to your object. Okay. So that's it for today. Um, a reminder to all of you, you should be working on your toy assignment. Um, play with these um, tools that I've in, um, introduced and explore a few more on your own. Um, one more thing, um, next week is spring break. So we won't see each other for another week and a half or so. Okay. So that's pretty much it for today. Any questions, comments before I leave you guys today? No? Okie doke. Then I'm going to wind it up and say goodbye. And I'm going to 